Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Teresa Marentet, CEO and Chief Nursing Officer of the Windsor Essex County Health Unit. Please be reminded that public health measures continue to be the most important protection to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Stay home if you are sick, maintain a two meter distance from others, wash your hands often with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, use proper respiratory etiquette by coughing into a tissue or your sleeve, and wear a mask when attending commercial establishments. I will now share our current case counts. There are 114,597 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 38,799 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 226 cases and Sarnia-Lambton has reported 299 cases. Michigan now has 78,507 cases with 12,449 cases being in Detroit. Today, we are reporting 2,245 cases of COVID-19 in our community, an increase of 24 cases from yesterday. 11 are workers in the agri-farm sector, nine cases are in the community, and four cases are still being investigated. 1,434 people have now resolved, 678 people are self-isolating, and 11 people are in the hospital. 27% of our cases are between the ages of 20 and 29 years, and 24% are between the ages of 30 and 39 years. 65% are male and 34% are female, and 1% is unknown. Our community has lost 70 people to COVID. 49 deaths have occurred among residents in long-term care and retirement homes. There are three long-term care and retirement homes in COVID outbreak. In addition, there are 11 workplace outbreaks. Six are in the agriculture sector and five in the manufacturing sector. Symptoms of COVID-19 can range from mild to severe. Some common symptoms include fever, a new or worsening cough, a barking cough, chills, sore throat, and shortness of breath. Call 911 if you have difficulty breathing and are struggling to breathe or speak, or are experiencing severe chest pain if you are feeling confused or losing consciousness. Please be reminded that Windsor-Essex has two COVID-19 and assessment centers. Erie Shores Healthcare in Leamington and Windsor Regional Hospital Lutt Campus. SOHAC in Windsor also offers testing for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people and their families. To check your results, please go to wechu.org and click on View Your Results to access the online test result portal. If you are unable to view your results, please contact the assessment center or healthcare provider that initiated your test. The health unit will call you if you have tested positive for COVID-19. Please continue to visit our website at wechu.org for the most current information and case counts. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us again. With the Phase 2 re reopening in Windsor and Essex County and Phase 3 reopening in other regions, we are seeing more and more workplaces opening up, and the potential for a spread of COVID-19 through these workplaces is also increasing. A key question that comes in everyone's mind is what if one of my coworker get COVID or what if I visited a commercial establishment and someone there was positive for COVID? I understand some of the rationale that we use in making public health decisions that are technical and may not be as simple to understand. As we are fighting this pandemic together, it is also very important for all of us to have a basic understanding of some of the key concepts in communicable disease control from a public health perspective. It is important for everyone not to get distracted by messages that we need more data to understand or we need more data to do the business or we need to know the hotspots to protect ourselves. I want to caution that the science behind COVID-19 spread and how individuals can protect themselves from COVID-19 has not changed. Instead of focusing on the distracted messaging, I want to urge you to please continue to follow the public health measures to keep yourself safe, including physical distancing, wearing face coverings or masks when physical distancing is not possible. And most importantly, please limit the number of close contacts you have. Today, I wanna to use this opportunity to get back to some of the basics that we have covered in the past with respect to chain of transmission and how contact investigation is done.
So the virus that caused COVID cannot survive outside of the body, and it requires a human reservoir to survive and multiply. Inside the human body, the, bo the, the body fight against the virus and develop antibodies. Before the person recovers from the illness, the virus desperately tries to find a portal of exit to leave the body to find a new host. Since the virus that caused COVID lives in the upper respiratory tract, and more specifically lives behind our nose and throat area, the virus can then generally exit the body when a person cough or sneeze, or when a person touches his or her mouth and nose. When a person coughs, this virus attaches itself to tiny water droplets and exit the body in the form of droplets. That is why we say that the virus is spread through droplet. These droplets do not travel that far and tends to fall down immediately, not more than two meters. That is why the physical distancing of two meters came from. And on the same note, if a person who is sick with COVID and if they wear a mask, that droplet cannot far and either get stuck in the mask or barely make it through. Once outside these, uh, the body, these droplets tend to land on individuals and gain direct access to person's mouth, nose, and eyes to infect them. In some cases, the infected person, after touching their mouth and nose, then touches another surface or touch another person that is shaking hands. The virus is then transmitted to another host. Indirect transmission through touching a contaminated surface also happen in the same manner. Now, the person who just got exposed to the virus needs to bring this, this virus to their mouth and nose to bring the virus inside their body, and the cycle continue. But if the person is washing their hands frequently with soap and water or alcohol-based hand sanitizer, any viral remnants in their hands can be eliminated through this process. What we do in controlling these infectious disease is we break down the chain of transmission at each of these steps. If we can get rid of the virus completely or eradicate from this world, then we don't have to worry about the virus at all. But unfortunately, that is not happening, at least in the near future. That is why we will have a human reservoir and we need to ensure that these humans are identified early before they spread it to others. Through aggressive case and contact management, we not only identify those who are sick, but also identify others who may have been exposed and if all the contacts were exposed are in self-isolation, and even if they develop the disease, they will not infect others. Public health goal the, of the early diagnosis and isolation of all those who are exposed and continues to be the most important measure to contain the virus spread. If that fails, we ask people to stay home if they're feeling sick or use a mask when they're sick uh, and to not to let the virus leave the body. If that fails, we ask people to follow appropriate respiratory etiquette wash hands frequently and avoid touching mouth and nose and eyes to break the chain of transmission. If that fails and if the virus gain access to the body, we need a vaccine to protect ourselves. Unfortunately, we do not have a vaccine at this point, so everyone will get infected and show symptoms of disease. And in the absence of any antiviral medication, the virus will continue to replicate until the body develops antibody against it, and then the cycle continues. As we can see, the most important public health strategy, especially in the absence of a vaccine or treatment, is controlling the virus spread and containment. In order to do that, we need to have a healthcare system that is prepared for early diagnosis and early detection of contacts, and isolating contacts to prevent further spread. The Windsor Six County Health Unit team is already doing an aggressive case and contact management, despite the high number of cases and contacts that we are seeing, and it has significantly reduced the community spread. However, we are still seeing having the case in our community and it highlights the need for ongoing education and protection for our community. What I worry the most is the false sense of security that many of us want to feel. We all want to believe that we have got it under control. I want us to be realistic on what is happening, what these public health measures mean, and how we will break the chain of transmission for COVID-19 to protect our community. When Windsor Essex County Health Unit receives a positive case of COVID, of course, we manage these cases, ensure that the person is isolated and is followed up by public health nurses and our team and our healthcare colleagues to ensure that their medical needs are met. 
In addition, it triggers a contact tracing investigation. We talk about close contact and close con invest uh, contact investigation, but what is contact investigation? It is a systematic process where we are identifying individuals or contacts that are close to the uh, that that are exposed to the case of COVID-19. And then, as a next step, we assess all these contacts for possible infection with COVID. Once we identify and assess these individuals, and if they are not a case at this point, we isolate these individuals even at that time to prevent any further transmission, even, even when they develop the disease. We also provide appropriate treatment and testing for contacts with COVID to ensure that they are uh, that we are not losing them in the in the big picture. So who who are COVID contacts? Um, and that's that's an interesting question that we have always come across with. Uh, what does it mean if I am with someone and if someone is positive as a, a in my workplace or anywhere? So contacts are typically individuals who have shared living space with a person with infectious COVID disease. So the key distinction is still is infectious. The person has to be infectious at that time when they had this close contact with. A person is considered infectious before the onset of symptoms at least 48 hours prior and uh, until, they are, uh, until the end of 14 days. Some of the usual ones include the household contacts, friends, coworkers, and also other individuals, for example, cellmates, shelters, residents in bunkhouse residents, long-term care home residents, retirement homes, etc. These are all identified as, uh, as, as close contacts. So what we do with contact tracing in uh, at the Windsor Essex County Health Unit, immediately when we have a case, positive case, our team get in touch with the positive case within 24 hours of receiving the positive result. We try our best to stay on top of it, despite uh, sometimes we do not have access to the right phone number or the individual is not available for us to respond. But within 24 hours, more than 90% of our cases are reached and uh, we, we, had, uh, we, we collect all the basic information that we need. As a first step of the contact tracing, what we do is we identified anyone who is a household contact and anyone who is a close contact. And, and then we, we reach out to everyone who is a household contact and close contact to assess their symptoms. And this all, all of this is happening within 48 hours of receiving the initial uh, positive lab results from the original case. And after interviewing all these individuals, what we, are, what we are identifying is if any of these individuals have any symptoms such as fever, cough, or any other COVID-related symptoms. And then we identify the, all of these contacts for either testing immediately if they are symptomatic. And if they are asymptomatic, we still ask them to, to, to self-isolate for 14 days while we monitor their symptoms if they develop any disease. In continuation, so anyone who is uh, who, who was symptomatic, they may turn out to be a positive case. The, the moment they turn out to be positive or they start to show any additional symptom, we send them for testing. And at the time of testing, uh, they are identified and if they are positive, then they are isolated uh, until the 14 days since the onset of their symptoms again. And the cycle continues until we get to the point of uh, not having the, the, uh, the, the spread in the community. The moment we identify all these close contacts, that's where the, the, the effort is to ensure that anyone who is identified as a close contact, they must self-isolate immediately before they develop any symptoms. Any close contacts at the time that we are connecting with them, if they're asymptomatic, may potentially be not infectious and may not be able to spread the disease. But within the 14 days of self-isolation, they may develop symptoms and they can, but they can spread the disease. That's why they must stay in 14 days of self-isolation. So anyone who is identified as a close contact, even if they're asymptomatic, that doesn't mean that they will not contract the disease. They can still contract the disease. If the, at the time that you are identified as a close contact, and even let's say the same day or the next day you go for testing and the results come back negative, you can still come back as positive even after 10 days or uh, before you finish your 14 days since your last contact. So please make sure that if you're identified as a close contact, you stay home isolated until you complete your 14 days and do not develop any symptoms. 
The contact tracing effort continues, and then what we are trying to do is we're trying to break that chain of transmission, and the sooner we break the chain of transmission, the less spread that we can see in our community. So getting more into the high-risk contacts versus low-risk contacts. So what we identify in, uh, in, among the high-risk contacts is household contacts. So anyone who is living in the same household while the case was not self-isolating and was infectious. So the person infectious, we, we consider it if they have to have symptoms. And anyone, when they started symptom, we go back 48 hours before the onset of symptom. And if at that time that individual was not self-isolating, we are, we are considering them as infectious and then that's where the, the, they are identified as high-risk close contacts with a high probability that they will convert into, uh, into COVID positive uh, individual. And then you have community and workplace contacts and all those places, if they are, uh, they, uh, the high-risk contacts are identified if they had direct contact with infectious body fluids of the case. For example, if they were, they were close with when and they were coughed on or sneezed on by the by the by the case directly, or if they had a close contact, and we are defining close contact as anyone who has come in close contact with less than two meters in proximity for at least fifteen minutes without having a mask. So that's why some of these recommendations, when we are saying that you know maintain your physical distancing at all times of more than two meters and wear a mask for everyone we are trying to eliminate any of these high-risk contacts. So the low-risk contacts for it will we identify is anyone who has household contact who has exposure with the case while the case was self-isolating and applying consistent and appropriate precautions, which means maintaining physical distancing and or wearing a mask at all times. So even in a household, individual could be a low-risk contact if by the time that the individual was uh, was self-isolating, they were maintaining their physical distancing, they're limiting their access, maybe re restricting their limitation to their room, and uh, not even coming in contact with any, co uh, any common areas. So they can still be a low-risk contact. When we expand it to community and workplace contacts, they can have protected, uh, pr uh, prolonged, um, prolonged unprotected contact, but while the case was consistently physical distancing. For example, attendees at a gathering. So if it's a mass event, if it's if you're in a mall or in a, any other setting where people are consistently physically distancing, or if you have a coworker in a common area, which is uh, which is which is not again uh, something that is uh, um, uh, that, that that the individual came in close proximity or was not wearing a mask, or if you had only transient interaction, for example, walking by the case or being briefly in the same room does not put you at a high risk contact. So all of these low risk contacts, we recommend that they that they monitor their symptoms. All their high risk contacts, they immediately go into self-isolation to protect uh, others around them. So one easy scenario that I can put uh, uh, together is imagine that this is a household, one household with a COVID positive or an index case, uh, and then we have a close contact A, B, and C. And, uh, and we can imagine that uh, close contact A works for ABC retail store, close contact B work for DEF retail store, and close contact C do not work at all. So then the key questions, what we are asking from the index case is, was the index case working? And if they were, were they, were they using PPE? Or they have put someone at risk because they worked while they were infectious. Uh, from a public health case and contact management, we, we reach out to all these high-risk close contacts immediately. And then when we, are, when we are working with the general public, physical distancing measures maintains or if everyone is wearing a mask. So in theory, if we are following physical distancing at all time, we will already be in a lower risk category. If everyone uh, around us, including ourselves, combined with physical distancing, uh, we're using a mask, we are decreasing the risk even lower. If we add hand washing to it, we further decrease that risk. If we are staying home when we are sick, we are, we are, if we are staying home when we are sick, we are not putting anyone at risk and potentially the risk will go down to negligible limit. And while we get all these uh, answers from, uh, from our case investigation, all of these things that we, we consider to identify any high-risk close contacts, and then our team reaches to all of these high-risk close contacts at, um, um, uh, at these workplaces and notify them about their obligation, whether they need to be self-isolating or whether they need to self-monitor their symptoms. 
So when we are when we are talking with all the uh, the close contacts, what we are trying to assess is we we are identifying the need if the, any of them have any symptoms and if they need to be assessed for COVID. And if they do, then we obviously we put them in isolation and then we expand the contact investigation further from those individuals. But at that time of our investigation, let's say if the contact were asymptomatic, but it was still identified as high risk contacts, we put them in isolation immediately and we ask them to follow public health guidance. So in summary, high risk contacts are at risk of developing COVID and they must isolate for 14 days to prevent any transmission. High risk close contacts are generally household contacts who are not maintaining physical distancing or wearing a mask while they were coming in close contact with others. With physical distancing and everyone wearing the mask, most individuals will already be in a low risk category and that's why all of these public health recommendations is very important for us to follow to reduce our likelihood of contracting COVID. And last but not the least, the key public health measure is still to reduce the number of close contacts to reduce the risk of contracting COVID. The less number of close contacts you have, the less likelihood that you will have, uh, that you will be coming in contact with anyone with COVID positive. Thank you. The conference is now unmuted. We'll now take questions from the media. Windsor Wright, uh, any questions? Uh, good morning, Dr. Ahmed. I see that uh, yesterday the, the deaths were 69 and today they are 70. Was there an additional death today and um, do you have any details about that? Yes, we do have um, uh, an additional death today. It's a man in the 70s and, and then um, died because of a complication associated with respiratory failure and was admitted in, uh, in ICU. Thank you. Any questions from CBC? Uh, yes, Dr. Ahmed, there's now 11 outbreaks at workplaces. I'm just wondering how many, if we know how many of the new cases are attributed to these workplaces? I, we don't have that information offhand, so maybe we'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Any questions from AM800? Dr. Ahmed, uh, later this evening, Tecumseh Council is discussing uh, the return of ICE in one of its uh, rinks at the arena. Uh, they, in the report, it says it worked with the health unit. Uh, are you and your team in favor of the ICE returning at Tecumseh Arena? Well, uh, every direction and every of these reopenings are uh, following the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act direction and the limitation and restrictions that are placed on the reopening. Our team work with, is working with all the municipalities as well as individual businesses to ensure that they are safely operating under the framework of Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. Um, if all of those measures are followed and all those control measures are in place, I think we're reducing the risk significantly and uh, that's where we want to go. We Obviously, we want to get back to some kind of uh, um, uh, a normalcy to our life, even despite this pandemic, but the key question continues to go back to how can we do it safely. And all these messagings and all of these work that we are trying to put forward is to ensure the safety and well-being of everyone in the community. And if we are all following all those measures, we will be able to reduce the risk of spread uh, in our community to a, to a minimum level. What kind of guidelines we put in place for some of these uh, locker rooms, dressing rooms? Because some of them are fairly tight and small. And if you have teams of 20 people, let's say, or 15 people, what kind of measures would have to be put in place in the uh, dressing rooms, locker rooms? So generally speaking, most of these locker rooms or places are already closed. They are not open to public. So people have to come in and uh, either be prepared uh, while if they're using that. Um, and this goes to any other uh, opening at this time. Many of these businesses and other places are following the same measures. Any areas where physical distancing could be a challenge uh, that, that is not recommended to open. Sorry, just to clarify, so if I'm a hockey player and I rent the ice, I can't get dressed at the arena? I would have to get dressed beforehand? 
Well, generally speaking, yes, that's that's what the uh, the 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 guidance is, and I don't recall reading all those the details myself, but my team did, and that's what my understanding is that uh, they they will be closed uh, the the locker room and areas, and people have to come in prepared or uh, find alternate ways to uh, to 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 change or whatever they need to do to protect themselves and uh, the uh, their 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 friends or whoever they're playing with their colleagues. Thank you. Any questions from Blackburn? Yes, I'm hoping you have a little more detail about the individual that died. Uh, do we know if uh, he was a case from the community or from a long-term care home? Say so he was a case from the community. Okay. Now, a lot of today's preamble was about uh, cases in the community and ending transmission within the community. And we do see um, not as many as an agriculture, but community cases seem to be making up uh, the next largest group of uh, people who are being infected. Are you concerned about uh, a community spread as we head into stage three? So, yeah, so what I'm, what I'm concerned about is, uh, is the, the close contacts and the number of close contacts. So I think even though when, uh, as people will work, uh, and will start to go to uh, different locations. They will continue to come in contact with other people. And uh, the whole of my uh, my talk today is even though when you're meeting other people, even though you're going to your workplaces, public health measure continue to be in place. That's the that's what that's how Teresa starts her day every day every morning by saying that public health measures continues to be in place. So please follow those measures. It doesn't it it is not changed. And if we are following all those public health measures, what we are doing is we are reducing our own risk. And then if we have a low number of close contacts that when we are not seeing more cases going beyond that particular individuals, even if they are infected, what we are identifying is now the number of close contacts is increasing, which is of a concern. And I think we, we must recognize that when we are talking about these social bubbles, when we are talking about reducing the number of close contacts, that is the most critical piece to break the chain of transmission, because once it starts to, once it starts to go into from one social circle to another social circle to another social circle, the the risk multiplies significantly. And uh, and and instead of focusing on some of the other needs, it is this still. It's the science is still going back to the basics. This is what you need to do. You need to physically distance yourself. You need to wear a mask. You need to wash your hands. All of those measures, those are the things that will that will protect you, and uh, people must recognize that that's the, still the most effective way. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're not giving any false sense of uh, uh, um, security or any false sense of concern to one one community versus the other community or one individual versus the other. That who's at risk and who's not. Everyone is at risk. It's, it's, it's everywhere. So we must follow each one of us, all the measures that we are asking uh, for everyone to follow. Now, at what point do you think we'll be ready for stage three? So I think uh, that's, a, that's a provincial decision, uh, first of all. But I think overall, as a community, we are still looking to make sure that, the, that we get it. We get the message. We need to follow all these public health measures. There's a huge difference from a stage two and stage three, especially with, the, with more businesses and more places. So if we are having some challenges right now in understanding the message, we may have more challenges if we, if we, have, uh, if we are in stage three. So I want to make sure that our community understands the public health uh, guidelines, public health recommendations, and public health rationale. So we definitely want to keep repeating the same message so that we, all of us, we continue to follow this message. And I get it, like there, it's, it's been a long time that people are following all these public health measures and there's a sense of um, um, uh, carelessness and there's a sense of maybe uh, getting tired with following all those recommendations, but it is still important. That's the, only, that's the only way we can make it through and that's the way we can get back to some kind of normalcy in our life and start to enjoy some of the things that we used to. So un until we get the message and until we follow that, we will be at a risk of uh, spreading and contracting the, the virus in the first place. Are you getting the impression that we are getting careless with the message? Um, I think the data is suggesting us that with the high number of close contacts with the more social circles and uh, people getting more relaxed with some of these recommendations. Uh, so it is important that we do not lose sight to what we are trying to achieve. Okay, thank you. 
Any questions from Windsor Star? Yes, good morning, Dr. Ahmed. Yesterday, Premier Ford announced uh, funding for municipalities, including public health. Uh, they're getting a big boost. So how important is additional funding for the work that you're doing right now? So I'll let Teresa answer that question. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the funding is very important for us. Um, as you know, we have uh, been using our existing resources and securing additional resources from other health units. Our board passed a uh, resolution uh, a couple weeks ago to increase our, our staffing, specifically for COVID, and also in the future. So the, the funding is very much needed as the role of public health continues to be the contact, the case and contact management, as Dr. Ahmed uh, described today, and that requires uh, resources, nursing resources. And as we do move into the different stages and the reopening, we're also looking internally at our existing staff and the services and programs that have been deferred or, um, you know, uh, kind of put uh, made core essential services that we're maintaining at this time. So as we get back into our regular practices, the funding for COVID and infectious disease management of COVID until there's a vaccine is very important for us. I know that announcement was just made public yesterday, but have any conversations uh, with the local health unit in the province happened yet in terms of securing that additional funding and uh, how much uh, we too may be able to secure? I can tell you that the proposal we submitted is uh, over $2 million for the resources that we need to continue on with the work of COVID-19 and uh, the case and contact management. So uh, we have not had any um, confirmation of that. We do expect to hear from the ministry in the next, in the upcoming days, but uh, those are the resources we need to continue to protect our community and to, to meet the timelines that have been imposed regarding the case management of 24 hours and contact tracing. Thank you. Any questions from CTV? Uh, good morning. How much time does contact tracing out of jurisdiction consume? Um, so out of jurisdiction uh, is typically we we refer them to our uh, to the health unit that's responsible for uh, for the contact tracing uh, or, or for, for their residents. So for example, if someone is a case here in Windsor and then we have a contact that is in Chatham Kent, let's say. So what we do is we send a referral to Chatham Kent, identifying that individual as a close contact. For them to follow up we typically follow anyone who lives in our jurisdiction uh, whether they are a case or a contact i guess on average how long does it take then maybe a day or two to get in touch with most high risk contacts is it is it a day is it two days is it a week our goal is 48 hours within we receive the uh, positive lab results. So most of the time we are reaching a high risk context within 24 hours, uh, but in some instance it can ex extend to up to 48 hours. That's our that's our uh, timeline that we work with. And generally speaking, again, when we're talking about close contacts in my presentation, I made that distinction that all these close contacts may not necessarily have the symptoms or develop the disease immediately. It takes time for them to develop the disease. So uh, the goal is to, to get to them as quickly as possible. And sometimes it's restricted uh, by just the number of cases positive that we are receiving in a given single day. If uh, and there were days in 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 our Windsor Essex when we saw an access of thirty plus case or even fifty case in one day, and then you are identifying all these close contacts, which could be up to three to four contacts on an average. Which again, it's increasing now. We are seeing somewhere in six to seven uh, co close contacts, and if you multiply that six contacts with fifty cases, you are looking about three hundred people that our team need to get in touch with. And with the available resources and with the issues of maybe not getting uh, immediately getting in touch with each of these individuals and the time it takes to do the interview, it can take up to uh, an hour to get all the details, to do all the education, to answer all these questions about these individuals. 
of what they are looking for, how they will protect themselves, what self-isolation mean, and, uh, and and all those details. So you can imagine 300 people, and uh, even if it's taking, let's say, half an hour for us, it's 150 hours that we're talking about with the staff time and some of the other challenges. So it's it, it can get pretty challenging, and, uh, and these are just one day. And then you have cases from previous days that are uh, already self-isolating that needs public health follow-up as well. So you can imagine the magnitude of the resources that it takes to do the case and contact management of everyone that are in our region, especially with the high number of cases that we are seeing. Thank you. Any further questions from Windsor Wright? No, thank you. ABC? No, thank you. AM800? Uh, yes, one for uh, Teresa. Teresa, almost a spin-off to my first question, but with your staff going through all these reports, for example, arenas and different facilities like that, I know Dr. Robin mentioned working with the school boards. What's the resources? How pressing is this for you and your team? Because obviously you're looking at the agri-food sector, you're looking at community spread, the healthcare sector, and now you have different, uh, I guess, facilities wanting to open. How has this been on uh, your team? So you have provided a good overview of the workload and you're right, there's many competing priorities and supports that we're providing to our community. So all of these plans are very detailed. Uh, the, the plans that we're receiving from the school boards, from municipalities, from businesses, they're very detailed because people want to comply. They want to um, make sure that they're you know, that their staff are protected and the community is protected as they come to, you know, enter these these establishments. We are using all of our, our resources. Uh, the majority of our staff are redeployed to COVID. That includes all of our managers and um, um, all of the different disciplines that we have. As we reopen uh, more services for our dental department, they continue to support our call center. So even though they're, they're pulled back to do the essential dental work for urgent uh, children and seniors, they're also still um, helping with COVID. So every resource that we have available to us, every manager, senior manager, we're all doing um, our part to make sure that all of these needs are met. And in addition, we have you know, support from other health units. And the ministry continues to um, have communications with us to determine what else they can do. Uh, we have received help from a field epidemiologist and we're in other conversations regarding some more assistance. So we are accessing everything that's available to us, but you're correct, there are many competing priorities and um, COVID remains the majority of our work, uh, recognizing that there, there are many facets um, outside of the case and contact management, but the reopening creates um, more attention to detail as well. Thanks, Teresa. One more, Dr. Ahmed, just in regards to the death. Uh, you mentioned it was community. Any idea when this uh, person first uh, was a confirmed case and uh, were they rushed to a hospital? hospital? Can you share any details about that, Dr. Ahmed? So we, what we know is this person was admitted sometime in the middle of July, uh, and then uh, purposefully I'm not giving you the exact date, but uh, sometime in the middle of July that person was admitted uh, to the hospital and then was later transferred to ICU and uh, unfortunately uh, died as a result of COVID-related complications. He also had uh, many underlying health uh, concerns as well. Thank you very much. Any further questions from Blackburn? What other health units are helping you out, Teresa? So we have um, health units from across the Southwest. So we do have a public health mutual assistance agreement with our area health units. So that would include Lambton, Chatham, Kent, Southwest. Uh, but the ministry also expanded the ask for us as our numbers continue to increase. And we also have health units from Haldeman Norfolk and I'm looking, Gray Bruce. Um, 
Huron and Perth, Sudbury. So we, they're all re working remotely. I don't want you to think they're all coming here. They're, they're working remotely and uh, doing that work. Uh, Middlesex London uh, provided Dr. Alex Summers for a couple of weeks. We continue to touch base with him. But uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it has helped quite a bit because of our case counts and the, you know, the ne necessity to reach everyone in a short period of time. Are they mainly doing contact tracing? Yes, uh, there's a case uh, management, case follow-up, contact tracing, and also there's a requirement to do uh, check-ins, so phone calls at specific times for people that are in isolation, so they're assisting with that as well. And in addition, we have um, some health units that have expertise in data entry, so all of the information that we are collating from the you know the people that have that are cases or contacts has to be communicated to the ministry in a timely manner as well so we have people doing that as well thank you very much any further questions from windsor star no thank you ctv uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just curious if the health unit has received any formal letter from the town of Essex uh, requesting more detailed data. Uh, I'm sorry if you've already gone over this, but my understanding is Kingsville will also be sending a letter. So um, has it happened or will there be any acknowledgement of it? So I can tell you that, yes, we have received the letter from Essex. And uh, I think one thing that I want to clarify that some of that data already exists. I think people just need to look at it. Uh, we do provide in our weekly summary is uh, a, a breakdown of each of the municipalities that what proportion of cases exist in each of these municipalities, uh, all the way from the beginning of the pandemic in the last 30 days and in the last seven days. So the, the, the details are there. Uh, when the pandemic started, um, obviously we were not sharing any of those uh, municipal level data for the reason that uh, the numbers are too low with the risk of identifying any particular individual uh, or individual municipalities. And it also it, it helps, it doesn't help to uh, uh, mitigate the risk that we can see. If we are seeing no cases in one region, that doesn't mean that people do not need to take any precautions in that one region or one municipalities. I think it is important that we know and we treat everyone that we are coming in contact with could be a potential case of COVID. And, uh, and any municipality, any region that we are going could be a risk for COVID. So I don't want to undermine the importance of that message. And I, as much as I appreciate the need for more data, but I don't, I feel any that, that there is any value to providing that level of detail. In fact, it may provide a wrong message to the community by identifying that one neighborhood is better than the other. Uh, some of the examples that we are seeing in, in much more denser communities where the population density is much higher and if those neighborhoods are identified, it's not putting any risk into individuals' privacy or concerns, but also it helps to identify the, the density of the population. Our Windsor-Essex is not densely populated, especially outside of the city. It's very sparsely populated. And if we are talking about identifying any region or any hotspot, it would put individuals' uh, privacy at risk. And it also undermines the, the whole importance of uh, taking public health measures. Uh, the, the, today I took the time to explain all of those details that why people should take precautions, what they need to do, and uh, everyone needs to take those precautions. It is important. It is absolutely important. And that's the way we can protect ourselves. The information that we provide could be as accurate as what we know, but there could be other risks. There could be an individual who could be infectious, but not known to public health. And if they are there, and if we are not taking precautions, we are putting ourselves at risk. So I, I, as much as I appreciate the need for more data, I also don't want to undermine the importance of uh, 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 um, taking public health measures and also do not mix this message with the need for more data to um, uh, and, and dilute the importance of all this messaging that we are doing. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.